If you'll be turning in your Bibles to Nehemiah uh, chapter 11, I'm actually only going to read two verses, even though we're covering all of chapter 11 and part of chapter 12. We'll finish Nehemiah in the next couple of weeks. Before we move, I think, to Ephesians, I believe. I've entitled uh, today's sermon, Building Community. Community is a word that uh, I use a lot around here. Because I believe with all my heart that community is very important. Now, when I use the word community, I also realize that it can be used in a wide variety of ways. We have communities, so to speak, everywhere. Our church is a community. It's a covenant family, but it is also a community. And you're probably members of other communities as well. You have a community probably at work. You have civic communities like the Lions Club or Rotary or Kiwanis. There are governmental boundaries for communities, right? Uh, you have the city of Louisville. You have the county of Jefferson. All of these are communities in one sense or another. But I believe communities are really important because it's within communities that really important things for God can happen. But real community doesn't just happen. We, we couldn't go out and bring 40 people randomly from the Sprint down here, put them all in here in the front pews, I might add, <laughs> and call it a community, could we? we? We are a community here in this church because we are here gathered around a common <clears throat> goal, certainly a common Savior. It takes work to form a community. It can be spoken or unspoken, but all communities have rules. And the people work to intentionally cultivate that community. Today, in our passage in Nehemiah 11 and 12, Nehemiah <coughs> is building community. And we want to look this morning at some of the lessons that grow from this passage and from what has happened up to this point about the importance of building a strong community. Let's stand as we do each week. We stand because we believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, our only rule of faith and practice. <laughs> We stand as they did in the days of Nehemiah. The Bible is infallible and inerrant. Hear the word of the Lord as I read just a couple of verses. Uh, chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. <clears throat> the people commended all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you that we serve such a great God, and we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this, your word. 
But we pray that we would see no man save Jesus Christ only. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. Now, most of chapter 11 in Nehemiah, and <clears throat> frankly, most of chapter, uh, or parts of chapter 12, are list of names again, right? We've seen this time and time again. In Ezra, as well as in Nehemiah, lots of listing of families' names that were important in the resettling of Jerusalem. Now, let's briefly remember how we got to where we are. At the very beginning of the book of Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah being kind of one group, uh, the book of Nehemiah really could be called, particularly the first seven or eight chapters, the memoirs of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah is cupbearer to Artaxerxes, the king in Babylon, and his brother comes back from a trip to Jerusalem telling Nehemiah about the condition of the city and the walls there. Remember that the first group of people left Babylon and returned to Jerusalem, those that were from the tribe of Judah that were captured by Nebuchadnezzar, and moved to Babylon. Eventually they become able to come back and under Zerubbabel they come, one group comes back and then another group comes back under the prophet and scribe Ezra and then someone returns from Jerusalem and tells Nehemiah the condition of God's holy city. And Nehemiah is overwhelmed. And he prays and he prays and he prays as he serves continually in the place where God has placed him in service to the king. In his prayer life, he is praying to God about this news. And after many months of prayer, God calls him to return to Jerusalem for the specific task of rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. And so he, after many months, has a plan. He's thought it through. God gives him the opportunity to talk to the king. And God paves the way for him to return to Jerusalem with this burden of rebuilding the walls. And in place with that, God has so moved the king that he gives him wood, soldiers, and safe passage back. You could not have drawn up a better opportunity, a better, smoother way for Nehemiah. He goes back, and despite opposition from those who are there, both inside the Jewish community and outside the Jewish community, Nehemiah, through the very power of God himself, accomplishes what never would have been dreamed, that in 52 days, the walls of Jerusalem have been rebuilt. We looked as we studied Nehemiah at all the various leadership lessons that Nehemiah brought to bear in leading the people there. His detractors were amazed and his people were enthused. But after the wall was completed, few people lived in the city. Nehemiah's next calling was to resettle the city, to create a community in and around Jerusalem. And with the within the context of that new vision that he has, that now he has a protected city where people can come and be safe, what does he do with that city? 
he gathered the people at the water gate and Ezra came out and for six hours the people stood. Now just imagine the scene, six hours standing in the sunlight as Ezra on a lifted up stage read the law of Moses. And as he read the law, the people wept. They wept over their own sinfulness. They wept over God's goodness to them. And they wept over they wept over what they had been missing. A month later, Nehemiah re gathers the people. And for three hours they, they confess their sin. Three hours. They felt the need to so come clean with God that they would cry out to Him and worship Him in the context of confessing their sin. Well, after that, they are led to renew their vows to follow Jesus or follow God. And they all sign a binding agreement that they will follow the law of Moses and if they don't, then God should feel free to curse them. So were they moved to desperately get back to being the people of God. So now we come to chapter 11. They have pledged themselves not to neglect the house of God, to provide for the temple and for those who carry out the work there, to provide leadership. And, and Nehemiah has appointed leadership in the city, civil and religious. But now as we come to chapter 11... Nehemiah has to get people to live in the city. Now, we might not think that that's a big deal. But just imagine Jerusalem after, at this point, a hundred years of neglect. People were in captivity for 70 years and then groups began to, to come back, but... I think about um, what happens when you don't take care of things. I can just imagine somebody walking down an old street in Jerusalem and a tree is growing up right there in the middle of the road because nobody has cared. <laughs> Trash, debris, all of those kinds of things there. The town needing a a community to revitalize it, to bring it back. Disre disrepair everywhere. It was much easier, frankly, for the people to live in the existing outlying cities of Jerusalem where people had been than to come into the, to, to the main protected now city because of the lack of any structure. So Nehemiah has to get people back, and slowly it begins to come back. And we see here in chapter 11 and 12 some of the ways in which Nehemiah went about reestablishing the city once it was secured. And there are lessons for us here <clears throat> as we try to strengthen our own community. The first one comes at the very beginning of chapter 11. It says that the leaders of the people settled into Jerusalem. And so we see from the outset that Nehemiah gets those who are in charge to come back and live in the city, both the civil and religious leaders to come back and commit to begin to grow a community there. 
we know that community often begins with good leadership. In a church, the church looks to the leadership to help them build community. God commands both <clears throat> civil authority as well as spiritual authority, doesn't it? Remember when Jesus is in front of Pilate during his trial, <clears throat> he says to Pilate, look, you wouldn't have any power, no authority, if God hadn't given it to you. Paul tells us over and over again that civil authority is appointed just like religious authority by God himself. So one of the lessons of community is the need for leadership to be committed to it. So if we're going to if we're going to grow our community here called Louisville Presbyterian Church, our leadership has to be committed to a common vision. We have to put that out to the people. What is it we're here for? Why are we here? What are we doing here? And I think our session does a good job of that sometimes. Nehemiah goes to great lengths to detail out the descendants of those who come. He, we have to remember that, and if you look at the list in chapter 11, that the southern kingdom, Judah, was made up of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And so for Nehemiah to get buy-in, he gets buy-in to begin with from the old established family. Those in leadership, those that looked, people looked to for the way to go. The leaders of those tribes and the priests and the Levites and the gatekeepers and others who serve in the temple all come back so that a community is beginning to be formed. And these leaders were committed to the vision that Nehemiah had put forth. They came in, they got out of their comfort zones, and they came into a city that was barely functioning, and yet they, were, they came there joyfully because it was God's holy city. For us today... Creating strong community sometimes means we have to get out of our comfort zones. We have to stretch a little bit. We have to be willing to go to places like Bridges and Brooksville and other places and talk to people that we frankly don't know. And sprinkle our conversation with Jesus. In keeping with that, this idea, we see in the rest of verse 1 and in chapter 2, bringing leadership in wasn't enough. They needed more people to come into Jerusalem. After all, this is a new walled city, a, a city that has, has been glorious in its past history. And they need not just leadership, but they need workers, everyday folks. And so they go out to the Jewish community and they cast lots. And one out of every ten is chosen to move back into Jerusalem. And look what it says about it in verse 2. The people commended all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. The people were excited that these people would be willing to get up, to pick up, to move out of their comfortable houses, perhaps, out of their standard way of life, and to go and populate the new city. You can just imagine, perhaps, as these families pack up from one little village or another, and they, the people know that their lot was chosen to move back 
to Jerusalem, you can just, you can just imagine the town coming out and, and cheering them on as they go into Jerusalem. Oh, you have been chosen by God Almighty to move back and begin to create community. Now, how do we transfer all of this to our lives today? How do we look at Nehemiah and apply that to ourselves as we live in the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ? Well, I think in the big picture, certainly, our country is in turmoil. After all, our country is the biggest community that we probably identify with. And the problem is that we have, we have jettisoned the very thing that drove Nehemiah's community. And that is, the people came to live in Jerusalem, both the civil and religious leaders shared a vision of God together and they were bound to communi- to build their community around that vision of God so in our country we've jettisoned that we've jettisoned the fact that we were founded on religious principles the Bible. We've lost our sense of commitment to God. Writing, this is fascinating, writing more than 20 years ago, Cyril Barber writes this. Listen to these words as they apply to our biggest community, which is our country. A strong religious commitment is essential if a democratic form of administration is to succeed. Without adequate spiritual values, it is hard, if not impossible, to retain the idea of obligation and responsibility. Individualism cannot long be held in check by good works and self-restraint. When this control is weakened, legislation takes the place of spiritual convictions and becomes the foundation of the community. And with an increase in legislation, there is a corresponding increase in bureaucracy with a minimizing of efficiency and a demutation of personal worth. Wow. What he says basically is spiritual values are essential for a democratic form of government. For our country to return to true freedom, we must be have, willing to have people who will apply God's principles. We need Christians, not Republicans or Democrats. People who are ground their actions and their decisions, not in legislation, but the conviction of God's truth is an abiding and absolute truth. Secondly, as we move to a more local understanding, to have a vibrant, growing community, people must, must be willing to get out of their comfort zone. We gather here as a community, and yes, we are gathered under one banner, one flag of Jesus Christ. And yet for our community to grow, we must sometimes get out of our routines to accomplish big things for God. In our passage today, people had to move from their comfortable own homes to live in a barely functioning city. Paul, throughout all of Acts, we see him having left the comfort of his own home 
to become uncomfortable, even to the point of death, to grow God's kingdom. So I ask you this morning, how comfortable are we getting out? Changing our habits so that we do and reach for bigger things for God. Are we willing to take great risk for great rewards for Christ? Are we willing to go where God directs to seek out those who need the gospel of Jesus Christ? We must always be the hands and feet of Christ. We saw that as we went through Acts last year. But for us to be a vibrant community, not just a community that exists, that moves along, but to be one that flourishes and grows, both numerically and spiritually, we must build on the foundation of God's work, of Christ's sacrifice. And we must recognize that that sacrifice that has been applied to us by the power of the Holy Spirit is for more than just us. <clears throat> it is for the people down the street. We must live sacrificially following Christ's sacrifice for us. For he left the comfort of heaven itself to come here to die for you. To shed his blood, to experience shame and humiliation because he loved you so much. Are we not willing to do the same? As we build community, may we be willing to choose and try great things for God. For his word never goes out from him that it doesn't return full of joy of life. Amen.